church. We want to welcome you to worship. We have a wonderful worship ahead of us this morning. If you're joining us for the first time, we're so excited that you found us and that you have chosen to join us in worship. Well, as always, we like to give a shout out to some of the celebrations that we have in the life of the church. We have several for you this morning. The first is for the Mossman's first granddaughter. Her name is Emily. We're so thankful for the birth of Emily and so uh, we just celebrate with the Mossman's family. We also want to celebrate another baby that was born during COVID and that is for the Musel's family and they had a baby boy named Max. We also want to celebrate uh, Pam and Mark Webb's anniversary this week, as well as TJ Maroney's birthday. Happy birthday, happy anniversary. Uh, we celebrate with you. Now on September 6th, we have our first outdoor worship service with communion. It will be out on the church lawn. We invite our church family to come to bring friends as well. You'll hear more about the details for this service at the end of this service. So be sure to tune in to that uh, later in the service. Well, Pastor Bobby has a wonderful message planned for us today and a familiar passage of scripture. Uh, it's about David and Goliath, but I think we will be surprised at this new way of looking at this familiar passage of scripture. So as we prepare our hearts for worship, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to, to hear your message, to, to be able to join in song, to be able to pray with and for one another. And Father, we thank you that you are with us wherever we are gathered today. And we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear your message. And Father, I pray that you would help us to respond in a way, Father, that would honor and glorify you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good morning. Please join us in singing hymn number 370, Victory in Jesus. This hymn holds great meaning for many of us at Deer Lake and for one group of friends in particular who celebrate their longtime friends and teachers, Bob and Martha Spivey. This morning, we sing Victory in Jesus to honor the memory of Martha and celebrate Bob's special contributions to this church. Bye. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hey church, this is the part of the service where we want to worship God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And I just want to remind you of three different ways that you can give safely and securely. The first is you can give online by going to the church website. Second, you can mail your check in. And finally, you can drop your check off in the front office. One of the cool things, because of your generosity that we've been able to do uh, this past week, not just one, but two different schools, um, we were able to um, host and provide uh, food for a teacher breakfast. Uh, some of the pictures you're seeing um, right now, they come from Kalan Lakes Elementary School and from Childs High School. Um, another thing that I know that um, we have been missing is the community aspect of being in church together. Um, coming to you guys soon, we're going to be having a, a group where you guys can um, submit to us your prayers and your praises. Um, but right now, if you could, just click the link below here and submit your prayers and praises so that we can lift them up, um, so that we can be praying for you and celebrating with you um, during this season. Um, if you would now, join me in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you. We praise you for being faithful. Lord, we come to you now with our difficulties, with, with anxiety, God, with brokenness, but also with hope and, and joy, Father. And we ask, God, you take these things and be glorified. God, we ask that you meet us in the midst of this chaos. Lord, I pray that you prepare our hearts to hear from your word, that we might be transformed to go out, God, and glorify you and honor you with our lives. Father, let us pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Hi guys, it's Sylvia Carver with Children's Ministry. The past three years in which I have served the children and their families here at this church have been an experience filled with growth and love, one in which I will always cherish. However, after much prayer and consideration, I am deciding to follow a new path in which God is leading me. With all the uncertainty that 2020 has brought us, I feel that it's in my family's best interest for me to be more available in our home with our children. Thank you so much to the families who have allowed me to be part of their children's lives. It has truly been my pleasure, and I feel I have learned so much from each and every one of them. You all have become an important part of my life. And I really do not take this decision lightly. The people of this church have become family to me, and I wish all of you grace and love. One of my favorite verses comes from the book of Psalm. Chapter chapter 37, verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. As we change our focus onto the Lord, so our faith in Him is excited within our own hearts, and we are encouraged. When the will of man is aligned with the will of God, as it was intended in the beginning, then the things that delight our Heavenly Father will naturally become the joy of our own heart. And when we delight in the Lord and take pleasure in the things that are pleasing to God's own heart, we will discover that they become the joy of our own heart. I really wish you guys well. I will be seeing you around as I'm not going very far. I love you and thank you again for allowing me to serve. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron. And his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel, Why have you come, come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were greatly dismayed and greatly afraid. 1 Samuel seventeen thirty-two through 37 And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Help us to see and hear and feel you through it today. Would you use this time to help us grow in our faith and become the kind of people who trust you more and more in each area of our lives? We give you all the glory and honor and praise and pray that this is all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Good morning, church, or good whenever you happen to be watching and participating in this. My name is Bobby. I'm one of the pastors here at Deer Lake. Thanks so much for joining us. Like, I know these are weird times, and you could literally be doing anything else right now, uh, but you're here, wherever here is, and, and I truly do believe this is not the only way, but this is, this is one of the ways we can continue to grow uh, during this really unprecedented season. So uh, so thank you for joining us, and good on you for taking that step and uh, kind of investing in yourself during this season, and I, I hope this is not just good news to you, but it will become good news through you as well. Today, we're going to be talking about a story that for a lot of people is probably pretty familiar. Uh, we're going to be talking about the story of David and Goliath. And just so you know, when I'm saying story, I don't mean story as like, like it's not true. Uh, it's just something we read in the scriptures. And, and here's the thing about this story. The one thing that I think all of us agree on, I think everyone would agree, that when we're talking about David and Goliath, where we're talking about this giant and this young shepherd boy going out to a fight, that it was an unfair fight. This was an, uh, let's just all be crystal clear on that. This was an unfair fight. It, it was never fair. It was always lopsided. It was always one-sided. It was an unfair fight because Goliath never stood a chance. Like, I know if you've grown up in the church, that's not how we approach this. David's the little guy. He's the runt. He's the underdog. Goliath is like the champion. You know, it was an unfair fight and slanted towards Goliath. I'm telling you, that is wrong. It was an unfair fight, but Goliath was the underdog. Underdog. Goliath never stood a chance. And I, and I want to show you uh, why that's true this morning and why it's going to be good news for your life to, to, to see it that way as well. And so I want to explore three areas for you that I feel like gave David a huge advantage over Goliath. And it's these three things. David had the better preparation. David had the better perspective. And David also had the better purpose. Better preparation, better perspective, better purpose. So let's unpack this. Uh, the first thing is that he, David was better prepared. Now, when we read the scripture and we get into 1 Samuel 17, one of the things that we hear about Goliath is just how big he is, how fierce, how strong. I mean, this guy is incredible. Listen to the way the scriptures describe him in the beginning of 17 again. He's a champion. I mean, I mean, that, wouldn't you like to be introduced that way? He's a champion. Uh, he's massively tall. Now, scholars kind of vary a little bit on how tall he may have been. Uh, some kind of go really, really big. Some say more like around seven feet tall. Now, for us, when we hear seven feet tall, like that's not that big. That's like NBA big, but we're not like, oh my gosh, a giant. But the thing you need to understand, the average person during this kind of ancient time period, uh, from what we best we can tell from like archaeological, archaeological digs, five foot five. That means if, if the average warrior is about five foot five and Goliath on, on the kind of like conservative side of things might be, uh, you know, around seven foot tall, that means he's about 19 inches taller than the average warrior out there. I mean, that, that's a, that's a big difference. This is a big dude. And look at the way he's described. He's got a helmet of bronze. He's got a coat of mail and it weighs like a ton of weight. And he's got bronze on his legs. He's got a javelin. A sword. I mean, he, he is the real deal. You would see this guy coming down the street and say, I don't want to mess with him. And so when we read that, we're thinking to ourselves, oh my goodness, like who in the world would want to mess with this guy? And you see the response of the Israelite army. None of them want to mess with him. And we read it, we're like, we can understand that. And so we've been accustomed to, to kind of hear the story and think, well, he's well equipped, he's well prepared, David not so much. But here's the thing about David. I want you to listen to what David says in verse 34. Uh, actually, we'll start in verse 33 of chapter 17, because David goes to the king and say, why are we freaking out? Why are we panicking? I will, I will take this guy on. And the king, uh, King Saul, is like, appreciate it, love the enthusiasm, not a good idea. He's been training for this all his life. Before you were even born, he was learning how to kill people. And David, I, I, I love the, the enthusiasm here, but, but you just don't have what it takes. And listen to what David says. This is verse 30, uh, 34. But David said to Saul, okay, your, your servant, me, 
I, I used to keep sheep for my father, and when there came a lion or bear and it took a lamb for the flock, I would go after him, and I would strike him and deliver it out of his mouth. And if this beast would rise against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down lions, I've struck down bears, and this Philistine giant will be just like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. So David is sitting here having a conversation with the king, and the king's like, look, I appreciate it, man, but you don't got what it takes. He's more prepared than you. And David says, uh-uh, he's not more prepared for He's not more prepared than I am. Check this out. Because from the time I was a child, I've been caring for my father's sheep. And when a, when a bear or when a lion, when a wild animal would come after it, I would go after the bear. I would go after the lion. Do you hear what David's saying? David's saying, look, this guy might be fierce, but I've been fighting with wild animals. I've been fighting stuff bigger than me. I've been fighting stuff stronger than me. I've been fighting stuff faster than me. And I took them down then. This beast, this Goliath, this giant will be no different. See here, check this out. Goliath was incredibly prepared. He was. He was fierce. He was strong. He had the right resources and technology. Goliath was incredibly prepared. The problem is he had just never prepared for somebody like David. He was really well prepared. He just wasn't prepared for someone like David, for someone who wasn't intimidated by his size, who wasn't overwhelmed by his stature, for someone who wasn't uh, choked up and caught up in fear by his strength and skill and ability. Goliath had never trained a day in his life for someone like David, whereas David had trained every day of his life for someone like Goliath. David had been preparing to fight and battle uh, creatures that were bigger than him, stronger than him, faster than him, wild. I mean, think about it. Wild animals don't have like a moral code of how a fight should go. It's all about survival. There's no just war theory amongst animals. I mean, but David has been trained in that Goliath had never trained a day in his life for someone like David. But David had been preparing for someone like Goliath every day. When it came to preparation, Goliath may have been well prepared. He just wasn't well prepared for someone like David. David had the better preparation. But the thing about preparation is it'll only take you so far. Preparation is great, but you need more than just preparation. David didn't just have the better preparation. He didn't just have the better training. He actually had the better perspective. Listen to what David says in verse uh, 37. So after he has told the king, hey, look, I fought bears, I fought lions, this, this giant will be like them. He says this in verse 37. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, the one who delivered me from the paw of the bear, this God, my God, the Lord will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He delivered me from the lion. He delivered me from the bear. And he will deliver me now. You see, David had the better perspective because David was able to see that his success, his survival, his victory was not a product purely of his own effort and strength and skill and ability. David is able to look back on his past victories. He's able to look back on those battles with the lions and the bears, and he's able to recognize the favor and faithfulness of God at work in those moments. David is well aware of his participation in those moments. He's probably got the scars and the teeth marks and the claw marks and the and the bruises to demonstrate that he was actively involved, that he, he's not downplaying or minimizing his participation. He simply recognizes that God was at work at those times. His success, his victories were not purely a product of his own effort or hard will, or, or, or uh, his own effort or hard work. His victory and success was a product of the faithfulness of God joining him in those moments. Preparation without the right perspective will come up 
empty. If you don't have the right perspective, your heart will not be able to handle the heat of all conflicts. Because here's the thing, if you look at your past and you look at your success, you look at your victories, you look at what you've come through and survived, and if you only see you in that, if you look back and you say, I did that, I made that happen, I accomplished that, me, me, if you look back and you can't see the faithfulness and favor of God as helping guide you through that and sustain you in that, if you look back on your life and you don't see the favor and goodness of God strengthening you and equipping you and supporting you through those really difficult seasons, there will come a season. There will come a challenge. There will come a conflict or a problem. There will come a giant who is bigger than your preparation, who is bigger than your strength, who is bigger than your ability, who is bigger than your capacity, who is bigger than your resources, who is bigger than your reach, effort, hard work, and ability. There will come a day when you will face something that is bigger, stronger, faster, and fiercer than you. And if it's up to you alone, your heart will not be able to handle the heat of that trial. David had the better perspective. He was able to see Goliath for what he is, recognize how big and fast and powerful and strong he is, but because he could look back at his life and see the favor and faithfulness of God sustaining him through those really difficult seasons, he was able to recognize right here, right now, that God was able to do today what God had done back then. Preparation is good, but perspective takes it to the next level. And the thing we got to understand, there's two things here I think it's really important to understand. One, in the moment, like when David is going toe-to-toe with a lion, when he's grappling with a bear, when he's doing... David probably is not fighting with that lion and bear thinking to himself, man, this is such good experience for me. I'm so glad uh, to be going at it with this lion right now because one day this is going to give me exactly what I need to face a really big obstacle in my life. Maybe a, maybe a human giant. That'll, this will really, he's not thinking that. Like he's doing everything he can to survive right then and there. But it's the perspective of being able to look back and being able to see the faithfulness of God there that's able to sustain him in this moment now. And so if you're going through something where you feel like you're facing a giant, I want you to look back on those moments in your life where God showed up, where where you shouldn't have gotten through, where, where the favor and the strength and the faithfulness of God came shining through. And it may have been difficult and you didn't see it in the moment, but with hindsight, you can look back and say, oh my goodness, that was God then. And if that was God then, why not now? Why not now? In the moment, it usually doesn't feel that way. But for those with the right perspective, if you can look back and see what God has done, you can look and see this moment differently. And that's what sets David apart, not just from Goliath, but from all the other Israelites that there, there that day. Because it is crazy, I mean, it's crazy to think that God's like, man, David, I'm going to do something really special in your life. I'm going to help you with these bears and lions. I'm going to give you victory. But you, 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 all you other people, y'all are on your own. I ain't helping none of you. Y'all just do life on your own apart. Man, God was at work in all of their lives. And if they would have had a different perspective, I got to believe that there was other people who could have looked at their life and said, wait a minute. God showed up here and God showed up there and God showed up when this was going on and God came through here. You know, how dare this giant, man, I know what my God has done. So I believe I know what my God can do. When you have a better perspective, it allows you to look at the past in order to see the present differently. David had the better preparation and he had the better perspective, which gave him significant advantage over his opponent, Goliath. But there's something else really, really important that he had that really sways the fight in his favor. Remember, this is an unfair fight. It's just it was unfair uh, for Goliath. Goliath didn't stand a chance. David had better preparation. David had better perspective. And David also had better purpose. Let me, let me read you this real quick here. Um, this is verse 
45, uh, just before this happens, uh, David has gone out to the battle line and the Philistine giant looks at him with like disdain. I mean, he's like, are you kidding me? This is who you're going to send my way? Are you kidding? You're going to send that one? Just so you know, Israel had a giant. We don't think of it like that, but Israel had a giant. If, you, if we go back a little earlier and we read about King Saul, King Saul was head and shoulders taller than everyone else in Israel. He may not have been the same size as Goliath, but he was a big dude. And I don't know about you, but where I'm from, if the big guy comes out, I'm looking, I'm like, hey, Saul, uh, where's our big guy? Let's, let's send these guys out because that seems fair. But instead, Goliath gets to the line and he doesn't see the guy who's head and shoulders taller than everybody else. Instead, he sees the runt of the litter. He sees David. And David is described as kind of like handsome and uh, like un, unscarred. I mean, he just, he's described as kind of like not the kind of warrior type and Goliath is furious. Are you kidding me? You, are you just going to make, are you insulting me? Like, how dare you send this boy, this child out here to do a man's job? And listen to how David responds. David says, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, uh, the Lord of the uh, uh, heavenly army, so to speak. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and I will cut off your head. He, David ain't messing around. And I will give the dead bodies uh, of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. Now check this out. So that, so that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel and that everyone here may know that it is the Lord who saves, not with spear and not with sword. But the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hand. David had the better purpose. You can hear the anger and hostility in the heart and mind of Goliath. He's bitter and enraged, insulted by the presence of David. But listen to how David responds. He says, uh, you come at me with sword. I come at you in the name of the Lord. And then he goes on. He says, at the end of all this, the earth will know that there is a God in Israel who is here and who saves. Ultimately for David, this moment right here was not about making a name for himself. It was not about proving how bold and brave he was. It was not about demonstrating his manliness. It was not about kind of working his way up in society and proving his worth amongst all the others. This moment right here was all about demonstrating that there is a God in Israel and this God can save. It's just this God goes about doing it it's in, in very unique ways. Not with sword, not with spear, not with a warrior who's headed and shoulders taller than everyone else, dressed in the finest, most appropriate wartime gear, but with a small boy with enough courage to step out with the right prep and the right perspective and the right purpose. David is there to demonstrate that God is God and that he can save. Now, this is where things get really, really good, okay? Because check this out. David knows that much. David believes that he is there to demonstrate the faithfulness and goodness of God. He is there to prove to the world that there is a God who saves. But check this out. Back in ancient times, names meant more than they do now. Names are important now, so when we have a child, we, we name someone something. But a lot of times, we don't really think about the meaning of the name. But what we find out in this moment is that David has no idea the gravity of this moment. He knows he is there to prove to everyone that there is a God who saves, but what he has no idea of is he's actually being caught up, swept up in the redemptive history. And this moment right here between David and Goliath is actually foreshadowing and anticipating the work of Jesus. You see, David's name means beloved. 
Can, can you imagine that? Like, he's small. Like, he's not the biggest guy. He's not the fiercest guy. And his name is Beloved. Can you? I mean, it doesn't exactly strike terror in the hearts of people. That's it. I've had enough. Someone go get Beloved. I mean, like, that's not, like, the nickname. I don't know many, like, professional wrestlers. That's, like, the, the, the code name they use, Beloved. Beloved doesn't exactly strike fear in the hearts of your enemies. But David's name means Beloved. And so Beloved comes out to the battlefield. Remember, from Matthew uh, 17 last week, do you remember what uh, God the Father speaks about Jesus the Son on the Mount of Transfiguration? He says, this is my beloved Son. In fact, at Jesus' baptism, same word spoken. This is my beloved Son. Son, when God speaks about, God the Father speaks about Jesus the Son, he refers to Jesus as his beloved Son. David's name means beloved. Now, Goliath, Goliath is a tougher name to translate. It seems to mean maybe splendor, but when you get at the root of the word Goliath, it actually means exile. So God's beloved comes out to face off against exile. And God's beloved, David, takes down and beheads exile. Fast forward to the work and ministry of Jesus Christ, God's beloved son. Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again for the forgiveness of sins so that the ultimate exile of sin and death, might be eliminated once and for all. Jesus came, he lived, died, and rose again for the forgiveness of sins to put death to death and so that he could exile, exile. Jesus Christ exiled, exile through his life, death, and resurrection. When when David and Goliath are going at it, it's not just about that moment right there. It's what that moment is pointing to. And what that moment is pointing to is the fact that Jesus Christ is going to come and do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He's going to put an end to that ultimate exile. He's going to put death to death. His life, death, and resurrection is going to accomplish something that we could never do for ourselves. It looked crazy when David was going out to face Goliath. It looked even crazier when God's beloved son Jesus was going to the cross. In that moment when David and Goliath are facing off, It's pointing to something so much bigger than that moment right there. And David probably had no idea. But in that moment, God's beloved was facing off with exile in anticipation of the work and ministry of Jesus Christ, whose life, death, and resurrection as God's beloved son would end exile, that that separation that we experience between ourselves and God once and for all. When David and Goliath are going at it, in a sense, David is demonstrating, anticipating, foreshadowing the reality that if God is for us, nobody can stand against it. So when we get to Romans chapter 8, we read these words that echo maybe what David didn't fully understand just yet. But they are words uh, that have been fully realized because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also With him graciously give us all things. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who condemns? Remember when Goliath came out and he's condemning David? He's condemning, cursing, putting down? All of this is echoing that. David probably in that moment has no idea. But God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is anticipating these words. It is God who justifies, who condemns Christ Jesus, the one who died more than that, the one who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, indeed interceding for us. Who or what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to slaughter. 
Here's, a, here's Paul's response. No. In all these things, in all those trials, whenever we're facing whatever Goliath we might be facing, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, powers, height, depth, nothing else in any of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. David had no idea that when he was facing off with Goliath, when he, the beloved one, was facing off with exile, that he was anticipating, he was foreshadowing the work and ministry of Jesus Christ who would do for us what we could not do for ourselves so that we could stand and say, if God is for us, nothing and no one can stand against us. We don't often see all of that happening in the moment. We don't often see the full picture when it's unfolding. But if we've got the right purpose and we've got the right perspective, we can look back on our stories and see the faithfulness of God chasing us and pursuing us and sustaining us all our lives. So I don't know where you're at right now and I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what you've got going on. All I know is this that Jesus Christ has done for you, he's done for me what we could not do for ourselves. He has put death to death and he has exiled the ultimate exile and that that is separation from God. And so my hope, my prayer for you is that you would experience life in him, that you would know the joy of being known by God, that you would know that God's beloved son, Jesus Christ, has made a way for you. If you, if we were to go back into the first Samuel text, what happens is, is David, uh, he takes down Goliath, he hits him in the head with a rock, and Goliath falls down, and then David, like a wild man, takes off the head of Goliath. It's incredibly gruesome, I'm sure, but the moment he does that, it says the rest of Israel kind of wakes up. And they realize, oh my goodness, we've been standing here watching all of this unfold. God is with us. Church, we have something better than David. We have something better than a giant being taken down. Sin, death, guilt, shame, conquered by the love and cross of Jesus Christ. So may you find life and healing and freedom and wholeness. And if you've been sitting on the sideline, may this be the moment you find yourself jumping up and joining the fray, knowing that if God is for you, who can stand against you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope and the life that we have in you. Lord, we know that this text is messy and it's violent and there's a part of us that pushes back against that. But at the same time, we recognize, Lord, that that sin is messy and it's broken and it's messed up and, and we need to acknowledge that. And so, Father, we pray here and now, Lord, that we would recognize our own participation in that stuff and that messy, broken uh, stuff that we call sin. God, we just, we repent of that. We acknowledge that. Lord, and we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, in love for us because you love the world so much. God, we thank you that he came to do what we could not. God, we thank you that through his life, death and the cross and resurrection, that we have forgiveness of sins, but not just forgiveness, that you invite us to join you in the ongoing restoration of the world. And so God, would you wake us up? Would you wake us up? God, would you wake us up to the hope and the freedom and the life that we have in you? We may not know the whole story and we may not see the big picture of what's happening in any given moment. But would you help us to trust you, to look back on our experience and see your faithfulness again and again and again and trust that if you did that then, you can do something now. We love you and we bless you, Lord. It's in Jesus' beautiful name that we pray. Amen.
incredible message Pastor Bobby shared with us and that reminder that if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, now the real fun begins as we put feet to our faith. And I want to let you know about several announcements. The first is one that I shared earlier in the service is that our first outdoor worship service will be held on September 6th. This is going to be outdoors on the lawn. Uh, We will also have communion with that. You can go to the church website or look at the page uh, to find out more of the details uh, for that service. We also want to let you know that small groups are beginning today, so it's not too late to sign up. We have all kinds of small groups for you to participate in. We have sermon discussion groups, men's, women's, as well as practical discipleship, such as financial peace and divorce care. And I want to sort of uh, push the guys a little bit. We have many of our ladies who have already signed up online. Uh, But guys, you need to go ahead and step up and sign up. So go follow the link that is behind below the um, screen here, or you can go to the church website and sign up now. And then last but not least, we have the opportunity to help provide meals for the Kearney Center. Uh, Due to COVID, they're not meeting in person at the center, but they are delivering meals to those who are in need. So go to the church website or look here on the screen and bring some of the items that are listed and bring those to the church on August 24th or 25th. So thanks for joining us. Don't forget to like, to share, or to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, We'll see you next time. Have a great week.